You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Hello, and welcome to a special bonus episode of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. When I put out the call to see if you had any questions for Colin Calloway about Native American experiences in early American cities, it turns out you had a lot of questions. You heard several of the questions that you had posed in our full length conversation in episode 314. This bonus episode includes the other questions that you asked and Colin's answers to them. These are questions like, how Native Americans interacted in early American cities in what is now the Midwest and Pacific Northwest, and what Colin means by the term and idea of urban frontier, plus questions about the artwork on the cover of his book, The Chiefs Now in the City. But before we go rejoin Colin, this bonus episode that you're about to hear is the kind of bonus episode that you can expect each month as a subscriber to the Ben Franklin's World subscription program. The Ben Franklin's World subscription program help support the time and labor that the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team and I put into this podcast. We also hope that we can grow this program large enough so that it can support regular additions to each episode. Additions that you've been asking for, like episode transcripts. But to make extras like transcripts possible, we need your help. Please become a subscriber. Join the Ben Franklin's World subscription program. You can do so by visiting benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. At benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe, you'll find more information about the subscription program and a link to gift subscriptions. This way, you can give the gift of Ben Franklin's World to all of the history lovers in your life. Again, to become a subscriber or to give a gift subscription to Ben Franklin's World, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. Okay, are you ready to dive in and pose your questions? Let's go rejoin Colin Calloway, who is a professor of history and of Native American Studies at Dartmouth College. Thanks for staying on with us, Colin. Now, Philippe wonders if you could tell us about the painting on the cover of your book, The Chiefs Now in This City. Could you describe that image for us and how it represents and contributes to the topics that you investigate in the book? Yeah, this is a painting of Boston by John Smybert. It's called A View of Boston. It's early 18th century. And I think I'd seen it before. I know I'd seen it before. I hadn't really paid any attention to it. But then when I was looking at this book, this kind of did it. Because it shows the panoramic view of the city skyline, which is spires of churches, that kind of thing. But across the water of Boston Harbor, there's a group of people in the front, and it's a colonial figure, colonial guy, and a knot of three Indian people and a dog. And he's pointing arms stretched out to the city. And this is actually kind of a, I'm not sure if this is what you call a trope, but you see this a lot, where you get views of early American cities, and there are Indian people in the picture, but they're not in the city. They're outside the city or they're off to one side. They are kind of part of the scenery, part of the context, but they are always apart from the city. And this is something I talk about in the introduction, that it reinforces our notion of what place do Indian people have in cities? And the answer is, well, they don't. That cities expel Indian people. Carl Thrush makes this point in in his book very clearly that Indians and cities don't coexist. Well, Indians and cities we know today do coexist. And apparently, they always have to some degree. So I suggested that as the cover for the book. And my editor said, yeah, that's the only candidate. I thought there were other good candidates too. But I think that with the title of the book splashed across it in quotation marks, the chiefs now in that city to indicate that this title that I used, I used it because it occurs repeatedly in newspaper reports 
trying to do a search of early American newspaper, if you do Indians, you get the usual stuff, reports of violence, killings, etc. But then I started to realize, I keep seeing this phrase, the chief's now in the city, and it was almost the go-to phrase for saying, there's a delegation in town. So we use that, and I hope that what that does, use of that title against that picture, is suggests that this is a book actually that's a lot about representation. This is, in fact, at the same time, very often misrepresentation of Native people. But good question. Thank you for asking that. As we discussed in our full-length conversation in episode 314, a lot of your book, The Chiefs Now in This City, really focuses on cities along the North American Atlantic seaboard. Mm. And Kristen would like to know more about how Native peoples west of the eastern seaboard interacted with early American cities and urban spaces. So, Colin, could you talk to us about, say, the experiences of the Métis people in Mm -hmm. early American French, British, and American cities like Detroit and Chicago? So I think if you're interested to start in the South, in New Orleans, I'd read Dan Asner's work because Dan has looked at New Orleans in particular. In terms of cities like Detroit, where, of course, in the period that I'm looking at, these are still relatively tiny. And in terms of, if we're thinking about cities just in terms of population, then these, shall we call them embryonic cities, are dwarfed by places like the Mandan Hadatsa villages. But one of the things that I think is important about when we look at the cities of early America, whether we're looking at the East Coast, say, in the 17th century, or further west, beyond the Mississippi, in the early 19th century, how many of these places actually come into existence because of Indian people, and in this case, Métis people who are there. They start life as trading posts. And that's true of, I mean, listen to us, that's true of Albany, Charleston, Montreal, Detroit, St. Louis. These places, it's not just the case that they are cities that attract Indian people. It's rather that they are places that become cities because of Indian people. Right? So St. Louis exists, comes into existence because of the important trade with the Osage and other people in the Missouri River. And I think in somewhere like Detroit, very much so. Tyre Miles has written a nice, interesting book about Detroit, but other people too. It's an urban space in a world that is at once indigenous, European, and heavily Métis. That's perhaps how I would phrase it. But I think of Chicago, because I lived in Chicago for a few years, and think of Chicago. Well, Chicago didn't exist before my book is finished, and it begins life as a small post. But I think one of the important purposes, of course, is location. Why is it there? And who is there? Is location and who is there also responsible for interactions that Native Americans had along the West Coast of North America? Leslie is very curious about the Pacific Northwest and the interactions that Native Americans along the West Coast of North America would have had with Europeans and white people in that region. And I think the thing to read there is Cole Thrush's book on Native Seattle. Cole Thrush wrote a book about Native Americans visiting London, but previous book looked at Native Seattle, and I think that's a great way to get at that. And the same kind of thing, you have places on the Northwest Coast that begin life that come into existence and grow, or maybe this is a belated time warp answer, they would have not grown the way they did had Indian people not been willing to go there and not gravitated to the and not been essential to those early years. Now, lastly, we need to talk about the F word, which (laughs) is how you referred to it in our longer conversation. And this is the word and the idea of the frontier. Nathan is intrigued by the idea of the urban frontier, which is something that you discuss in your book, The Chiefs Now in This City. So Nathan would like to know more about the idea of the urban frontier, what you mean by urban frontier, and how the urban frontier really differs from what historians typically call the frontier. So being that this is a large question, Colin, I really think we should take a step back and talk about Frederick Jackson Turner and his version of frontier which is the idea of the frontier that historians most often refer to in their work. So Frederick Jackson Turner wrote a very influential essay around 1890, which of course was not only the date of the massacre at Wounded Knee, 
ending the so-called Indian Wars, but also the time when the United States Census Bureau declared an end to the frontier because population density was such all across the country that the frontier could no longer be said to exist. Frederick Jackson turned around that moment and said, okay, let's think about that. What does that mean? That the frontier has been fundamental in the history of this country, not only in providing opportunities and land, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but in shaping democracy, in distinguishing America from Europe, that America is not just European traits transplanted. It's something different, and it's different because of the frontier experience lived out time and again as people moved west. And it was a kind of environmental determinism. I'm paraphrasing Turner here. You take a European colonist and place him in the so-called wilderness, and at first the wilderness is too strong for him. And how does he survive? He survives by taking on Native American traits, dressing like an Indian, hunting like an Indian, etc., etc. And then he re-emerges from that experience. And what re-emerges is not Indian, but it's not European either. It's something new. It is this American. Now, Turner's model, as he explained, it said, this happens time and again. So you can stand at the Cumberland Gap and watch this procession, as it were, moving west. The fur hunter, the trapper, the miner, the pioneer, etc. And then he said, do the same thing at South Pass a century later, you'll see the same thing. And it's an image that he created, or at least perpetuated, of expansion westward along a moving frontier that became ingrained in American thinking. You see it in American art. You see it in, hear it in the way politicians talk about this country. And of course, it dominated Western history, the history of the West, for a long time, both through the influence of Turner and his graduate students and disciples, and then as we all rethought it and said, we got to debunk this. This doesn't work for those of us who are interested and recognize the significance of Native American history, of anybody who's not part of that. So it was a very, probably one of the most influential pieces of writings in American history. We're still talking about it 130 years later. I wish somebody would talk about my books. You know, I mean, people read my books, "Eh, okay. And unless Liz says, let's talk about it on on this show, that's kind of it. But that, I think, is recognizing how that thinking has shaped our thinking. And I don't mean Liz and myself, I mean, as a society, it's still with us. And it's proven very resilient. And it actually has, at a time when we are thinking seriously about who we are as a nation and how we came to be that nation, and looking at a past that involves expansion, settler colonialism, and expulsion of peoples, that thesis, even though we might not call it the Frederick Jackson Turner thesis, but the influence of that picture of American expansion and nation building continues to have important repercussions. So now for Nathan's question, would you tell us about your idea of the urban frontier and how it differs from Frederick Jackson Turner's idea of the frontier? Yeah, I actually thought long and hard about using that word in the title because it has so many connotations. And as most of us know, I'm sure that there's been a long historiography of what this means, in many cases, a debunking of Frederick Jackson Turner's view of the frontier. But I decided I wanted to use it not to sort of reinvigorate that word so much, but rather to reinforce that word as a possibility for understanding multiple encounters and interactions and zones of influence. But the real reason I think I thought about it was a book written probably, I bet it's 60 years ago, I seem to think it's 1959 by Richard Wade called The Urban Frontier. And his is a book, and this is a dim memory of having read it decades ago, but his is a book basically talking about how cities, I would say, fit in that Turner model of the frontier, because cities brought institutions, churches and schools and all of the things 
if we like, that we can attribute or identify or associate with civilization as represented by cities. So if I wanted to sort of suggest that if there was an urban frontier abutting Indian country, that there was also an urban frontier that Indian people visited and experienced, and that in those spaces, they created frontiers, that frontiers is not a line moving across the continent, that you can have a frontier in the way that I'm thinking about it kind of anywhere. It depends on the situation. One of the stories that I've always been intrigued by is when the Lakota Oglala Black Elk is traveling with the Wild West show in England and gets lost in Manchester. What did an Oglala guy in Manchester do feel experience? Now, I know Manchester pretty well, right? And it was a frontier. It still is, right? <laughs> Even if you go from Yorkshire to Manchester, it can feel like a frontier. And probably that was one of the things that got me thinking about this. So can pubs and churches and streets in Manchester or London or Philadelphia constitute a frontier? Well, not the people who live there, but for people who are coming to it new, seeing it through fresh eyes, with uncertainty, with culture shock, all of those kinds of things. That's why I use that. I hope that people would see that I was using that not out of ignorance or dismissal of the debate over frontier that's been going on for a long time, but in many ways just to sort of use it in a suggestive way to think about what might we mean when we talk about frontier. Colin Calloway, thank you so much for spending extra time with us and for answering our questions. My pleasure. Thank you very much. If you'd like to discover more about Native American experiences in early American cities and port towns, be sure you check out our full-length conversation with Colin Calloway in episode 314, which you can find at benfranklinsworld.com slash 314. If you enjoy this podcast and you enjoyed this bonus episode, become a subscriber. Join the Ben Franklin's World subscription program at benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. On that page, You'll also find information about gift subscriptions for all the history lovers in your life. Again, you can become a subscriber or give the gift of Ben Franklin's World at benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. This episode of Ben Franklin's World is supported by an American Rescue Plan grant to the Omohundro Institute from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Jessica Brabble, Martha Howard, and Holly White. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation.